topic I want to talk about is how RNA and nucleic acid can relate to helping to make proteins in a interoperable And really, the, the main way I'm going to talk about that is the tRNA structure. So, tRNAs are important for um, sort of this is a very typical secondary structure here, and kind of referred to as a clover leaf structure of the uh, structure of tRNA. And tRNA interacts with mRNA. So mRNA is made from a gene, you have mRNA, and then the codons that are in an mRNA will be hydrogen bound via the anti codon tRNA in the ribosome during the process of making protein. Proteins, uh, amino acids that are going to be added to the uh, ends of the, each of the individual tRNAs. So like, basically groups of tRNAs, there'll be individual tRNAs for certain amino acids. And then amino acids will be combined together with the ribosome, and you'll get uh, you'll get proteins made. So we're not really going to get into much detail about how that works in this class. It's more biology at this point, or second semester biochemistry. Um, but the whole idea here is that we're just going to talk about the structure here of, of tRNA specifically. It forms a very complex structure. Um, like the, these segments would be kind of helical regions. It would form that sort of A, a type helix that we've been talking about the dimension helix. And then there are these loops that form. These are sort of, these are hairpin uh, segments on this end, this end, and down here. Um, and so it kind of this combines together all of this idea of the, the possible structure that RNA can have that we talked about a little bit last time. Um, and so this is the secondary structure. It's showing basically where the hydrogen bond is going to be between complementary bases. In the three-dimensional structure, it kind of forms this sort of L-shaped thing here, where this free loop <coughs> comes over and hydrogen bonds to this free loop, um, kind of forming, kind of changing the direction out here so that this top blue part here, colored the same way, kind of form points to the right now, and then uh, the straight uh, sort of red anti codon loop down here uh, goes straight down. So just to kind of roughly introduce the structure here, um, one other, uh, and so there's some interesting ways that these, uh, some of these bases are modified in here. Um, and these modified bases, for example, this, this, uh, this weird little symbol here, uh, uh, other like D, for example, these are modified, uh, modified nucleotides. And they allow for sort of interesting um, hydrogen bonding that will stabilize this secondary and tertiary structure of the RNA. I'm just gonna mention a couple types in passing. Um, and so these are these sort of um, using, so, so the, the uh, sort of uncommon nucleobases that we talked about at the very beginning last time, these come up here again um, in the hydrogen bond that we see in tRNA that stabilizes this tertiary structure. Um, and so what we see here is a 7 methyl guanosine. That was the one that was one of the sort of unusual ones that has, has a methyl group added to a guanosine, so it has an extra methyl group. Um, that in tRNA, that will interact, uh, sort of form an interaction here between a normal GC base pair, then the 7 methyl guanosine from the side, and then, strangely, just a, uh, the, the, uh, a phosphate backbone of another part of the RNA. That will actually come in and hydrogen bond. So, very strange here, not typical sort of double helical structure uh, 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 here for hydrogen bonding where the actual <coughs> phosphate here, the negative charge and the oxygen of the phosphate of, of another part of the RNA will actually come down and, and hydrogen bond directly to a base. So these, these kind of breaks some of the main rules, uh, so to speak, or the, the typical thing that we see um, in how a double helical structure is formed, because this is sort of a specialized RNA that forms this structure, this three-dimensional structure. So this is unique, you wouldn't see this in DNA. Um, another option here is where you have a, um, basically you have an adenine, another adenine, and a uracil, and adenine and uracil form a relatively typical base interaction, and, and then the ribose, the, the uh, free 2 prime hydroxyl that's present, so remember this is all RNA, so it has 2 prime hydroxyls all over the place. Um, a free prime hydroxyl on that ribose can now hydrogen bond to an adenine. Um, so that's sort of this another example of how tRNA can form this sort of unusual base pairing here that results in the formation of the three-dimensional structure. So I just kind of want to mention that <coughs> relatively brief, briefly here. <coughs> These are not stuff I'd have you draw out. I just want you to understand that there are 
these are modified bases or these other positions like the tetrahedral hydroxyl or the phosphate the fos the backbone. Like everything can be utilized basically for forming hydrogen bonds, especially in these complex RNA structures. And re really another reason why, why I mentioned at the very end last time, how you can have RNA that folds into a catalytic structure, like basically like that's called a ribozyme, similar to an enzyme. Um, it's partly because it has these possibilities for these kind of uh, complex three-dimensional structures that can make. So it kind of goes hand in hand here. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. So the very last bit I want to mention um, is now we talk about the structures, what happens when you bust apart, or you break apart these, the break apart the structure basically. And, and we'll focus on it with DNA primarily. So this is referred to as DNA duration. So if you have a fully formed DNA helix, um, uh, or really any helix, it's going to be RNA too, any sort of helix that's formed, uh, you can use temperature, change in pH, change in conditions to denature or break apart the double-stranded structure. So basically breaking apart the hydrogen bonding, the, the phase stacking, all those forces we talked about that stabilize that structure, things like just high temperature or change in pH can affect this. Um, and so you get single stranded strands here. These would form, basically lose the structure and kind of be random coils. They wouldn't have the helical structure anymore. So this would be fully natured, fully structured, double stranded DNA. And this would be denatured DNA down here. Um, you can plot this in what's referred to as a, uh, well, in this case, a, yeah, a, a DNA melting. Another term for denaturation, so melting refers to the denaturation of DNA from the double structure to the single strand um, on a curve here. Um, and one thing about the uh, denaturation of DNA, so remember DNA absorbs UV light at 260 nanometer wavelength. Um, due to the nucleobases absorbing the, the aromatic matrix of nucleobases. Um, when those bases are stacked in a double helical structure, they don't absorb as much UV light. They still do absorb some, but not as much UV light as they do when they're denatured or single-stranded, and they no longer have that stacking anymore. So, as you denature DNA, you shoot UV light at it, it'll absorb UV light at a certain amount when it's fully formed double-stranded, and it'll absorb more as you get more and more denatured. So more and more absorbance of UV light, as the DNA gets denatured. And you can plot this by actually showing what the absorbance level would be at 260 nanometers of light, for example, at increasing temperature. So down here, the DNA is fully formed, <coughs> double helical structure, it, uh, and then as you increase the temperature, higher, 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 you start to go, you start to denature that DNA, breaking it apart into fully separated bands at uh, uh, strands uh, at the highest temperature. You get higher and higher absorbance and you start to, to go. So the highest absorbance would be single-stranded DNA and the lowest absorbance, uh, which is not zero, so you see that's not zero, but it's the lowest absorbance would be where it's fully structured. Now, let's kind of plot this up here and you have a value called TM. The TM is what's referred to as the melting temperature. It's basically what the temperature is at which 50% of the DNA is on the denatured. Um, so in this case, basically half of what this would be is around uh, 75 or so degrees. Um, that's what the GM would be for this particular piece of DNA. Um, so that uh, basically implies that you can have different TMs based on the different types of DNA. Um, some of the things that will change the TM, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest things is the, 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 the content of the, like the sequence of the DNA. So if, for example, you have more GC base pairs in the DNA sequence, that will increase the TM. It'll make it so that it'll take more temperature to denature the DNA. Because remember, GC base pairs stack better in the, uh, 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 the uh, the bases will stack closer together, so you have better base stacking interactions with GC base pairs uh, and GC repeats, and you have three hydrogen bonds with a GC versus the two that you have between the A and the T and the complementary bases. So for both those reasons, high GC content, you would have, so let's say this is the same length of DNA at the, at the starting point here. 
Um, the TM would be, let's say you have 35% GC content, the TM would be lower here. If you increase it to 50%, you have more GC content, the TM goes higher, even more, it goes higher, so on and so on and so on. So GC, so basically this means that the sequence of the DNA dictates whether, basically how much heat or how much change in uh, pH or whatever it is you would need to do to the DNA to denature. <clears throat> Indicating that it was more, so if you needed more heat uh, to denature the higher GC content, that the starting structure would be a stronger structure with more GC content than it would be without. This has a lot of implications for gene expression and a lot of, in biology for like how DNA is replicated and how um, uh, genes are expressed in the RNA made in the protein. Uh, uh, heavily written, basically in our genomes are certain sort of sequences here in a lot of areas that are um, sort of the, 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 the amount of GC content will dictate whether or not genes are expressed from that area. So there's, there's a lot of connection to biology with this. Um, other things that increase the, G, the TM, so basically result in a more stable DNA structure, would be so more GC content. The longer the sequence of DNA, the strong, the state, more stable it is, because there's more hydrogen bonds there, so it take, the more hydrogen bonds there are, the more temperature you need to denature that. Um, you could change this, so remember salt stabilizes the DNA double helix by sort of neutralizing the phosphate backbone. If you have more salt in the solution that, that the DNA is in, it'll stabilize that structure more. So more salt will make it a higher TM. Um, also lower pH, that'll tend to make sure that everything's um, in the protonated state, so that'll make sure that the hydrogen bonds are more, uh, the, they're very well established between bases, so that'll also increase the TM. Yeah. Okay, so all these things will result in increase in TM, and basically increase in TM means that the starting double helical structure is more stable if you basically have these trends of, of these sort of things here, increase in TM. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the last bit I want to do a quick practice question. Um, so for this one, let's say you isolated two unidentified, so you have two unidentified species, and you uh, two of uh, bacteria X and Y, so bacteria X, bacteria Y, um, and you, you determine that basically you want, you want to basically determine what the genome content is of both organisms. Um, and uh, you basically figure out that, G, that the genome of uh, organism X is 32% adenine and Y is 17% adenine. So from this information, just these two values of information here, you should be able to determine what the percentages are of the other bases for X and for Y. So does anybody have any idea how you would do that? <coughs> Um, a and T would be equal, so we can assume thirty-two percent of T, and then G and C are going to be the rest of that. Up to one hundred percent. Up to one hundred percent, so then you have half whatever that is, so like eighteen percent. Exactly, exactly. So this gets back to the Chargrass rule, where and complement basically complementary bases, where whatever the percentage of A of 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 of. of, of, of for example, adenine is, the complementary base is T, A binds with T. And so there has to be equivalent percent of T in each organism. So X uh, here, 32% A, would have to be 32% T. So then that gets you up to 64%, and so we have 100% total possible here. So you take 100% minus 64%, and that total percentage there would then be divided in two for one half of that being for G and the other half being for C. So I think it's like, like I said, I think it's 18% for them. Yeah, 18% for G and 18% uh, for C. And so for this one, same way, and what you result in is, when you do, uh, when you do it out here, is that you, know, you have 17% of T and uh, I think it's 32% of G and 32% of C. Uh, 33. 33, sorry, 33%. Um, okay, so you get those values. Definitely know how to do that. Um, and once you get that, now we can relate it to the GC content, related to the uh, tying it back to this thermal melting stuff that we talked about. Now, you can then, then say, okay, well, these species were isolated from different spots. One of them, you don't know which one, was from a, a hot spring, so like really, really hot water. 
And so it has to survive in that hot environment. The other one from was in the Missouri River, which averaged quite a bit cooler than a hot spring. Um, and so based off of knowing the content that you've calculated on here, um, you should be able to tell me which organism would be more suitable to live in a very uh, stressful, high, high temperature environment versus a low temperature environment. Does anybody have an idea which one? This steps my really so somebody else. Um, okay. Yes, exactly. So when you calculate that, you get 33% GC for Y. Whatever organism has more GC content, that correlates to being able to survive a higher temperature environment. I mean, this is, this is like an extreme example, but that 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 definitely is, is definitely the case that's seen um, in in, in uh, biology. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to formulate my question, but it it has to do with the last slide that you're talking about um, factors affecting DNA. Yeah. Uh, so in the last class, we talked about um, I think it was like a a base and B base and C base. So, so do they all have the same? Um, like, is TM affected whether it's a A base or a B base well, more in a different way? Or well, for for this G, so remember, higher GC content has a higher TM, which means that it's a more stable DNA helix. Okay. And if you're at higher temperatures. You don't want your genome to denature. If the genome denatures, then the organism can't replicate it correctly and can't survive. And you want to so you want to make sure that the DNA is in the double helical structure in the genome of the organism of the bacteria. Um, so in this case, you would want you it, it, it would be basically a higher temperature. You wouldn't want it to denature the DNA so they could survive there. Does that make sense? Kind of. I just I'm I'm trying to figure out if if having an A base or a B base would be better for an organism, um, so that the TM doesn't get as affected as in let's, one let's, form. Let's talk after. I'm not quite sure we're here. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how to ask it either. <laughs> yeah, all right, sounds good. Okay. Uh, any other questions about this part? Yeah. Okay. So that was it with the new way out of this stuff. Quick. Change. Okay. Um, so, um, so now we're moving on to our next basic molecule in this class. Um, actually, yeah, this is the last one. This is the last basic molecule that we talk about um, in, in biochemistry one, and um, that's lipids, aka fat. Um, very important molecule. Uh, the thing about lipids is very diverse, like uh, category here. So we've kind of been like, okay, amino acids are only twenty. All these, every on board here, it's been pretty well defined what these structures are. Um, really, lipids are defined by the fact that they're hydropo hydrophobic primarily. So lots of carbon, not a lot of um, sort of uh, not, not not a lot of like, negative like, uh, of any charge at all or, or hydro. Uh, uh, hydrophobicity. Um, th these are all um, they're hydrophilic structures. These are very hydrophobic. They don't they don't dissolve in water very much. Things like wax, oil. That's that's what lipids are. <clears throat> um, so we go from uh, you know there might be some like you know carboxyl group here that you know there's certain components of these molecules that will have some charge on them, but the majority of the molecule is going to be nonpolar. So hydrocarbon tails, a lot of hydrocarbon tails. Um, this is a variety of molecules here. This is the structure of cholesterol here, um, very important for uh, biology. Um, lots of carbon, there's a little, like one little polar head group here, but for the most, for the most part it is uh, nonpolar. Um, so all these are very um, nonpolar, very low solubility in water, and are uh, uh, very important molecules for a variety of different things, as we'll see. So one thing is storage lipids. Uh, so basically in um, a variety of ways, uh, basically in a dietary fat or um, uh, a sort of excess fat that we have, that can be stored in a certain type of lipid. Um, 
One is the main, the main storage form is triacylglycerol. Fatty acids are sort of uh, the, the sort of um, related triacylglycerol that we'll see. Um, these are sort of uh, fatty acids will be combined together to form the storage form here of triacylglycerol. And so we can go store in triacylglycerol, and triacylglycerol can be broken down back to fatty acids, and fatty acids can be metabolized for energy. So kind of a, a cycle here. But think of these as storage lipids. Energy can come from, at, at, under certain conditions, energy can be derived from these stored triacylglycerols that have the fatty acids on uh, in addition, besides storage lipids, we have structural membrane lipids. Um, will uh, the, the, so all the membranes in our in cell they will have sort of um, form this uh, double layer structure that we'll get into more detail in the next chapter. But these are composed of phospholipids and a variety of modifications of these types of phospholipids and glycolipids. So these a variety of these types of specialized lipids that we'll get into probably on Monday. Okay, so starting with the storage lipids, um, starting with the simplest, basically the simplest type of storage lipid, and that is fatty acids. So fatty acids, um, these are long, so these are the ones that have the carboxyl group that one end, sort of the hydro, uh, hydrophilic head group, so to speak, kind of like one part of it's somewhat uh, hydrophilic here, um, and then the hydrophobic tail. So all of this hydrocarbon um, down through here, very nonpolar. These are a variety of lengths. They could be anywhere between four to eight to 10 uh, uh, carbons long, up to uh, 24 or so. 16, 16 carbons is the most common. 18 is also pretty common. Um, these are sort of the two main ones. The majority of fatty acids, just based on how we synthesize fatty acids in our bodies, are uh, uh, come in, um, uh, they're even numbered. So always an even number. Odd numbers do exist, but you have to do some metabolism to get them to be that way. It's much easier to make, uh, and we're not gonna get how we make them in this, uh, this class, but um, it's easier to make uh, 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 C16 and C18, the, the even number of fatty acids. Um, also, linear, so as I've drawn it here, these are linear chains. Um, they can be also branched, but that's also still kind of harder to do. We have to kind of go through some more metabolism to get to that. Okay, so overall, these are the two main ones. The two most common, like I said, C16 and C18. Um, these are the only, the, the really the only named amino acid, named fatty acids that I would like you to know. Palmitate and stearate. These are the two names of the most common C16 and C18. Um, the other various forms that C16 and C18 can come in that changes the way we say the name. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about naming all of the other uh, fatty acids with their sort of uh, uh, common names as we refer to. I'm going to get into how to name these basically systematically. That doesn't really involve you memorizing the psychotic. So we have sort of, like I mentioned, big range here. Um, the most common are uh, fatty acids are here in this long chain, um, sort of 13 or 12 or so, uh, uh, 22 or so carbons, and that includes the C16 and C18. You can have very long chain, medium and short chain, kind of variety here. Uh, the, the ones that are very long, these are usually involved uh, with a variety of cell signaling processes that we'll talk about next time. Um, uh, uh, and, and some other variety of things. And the most common one is the short one, or the, the long chain one. So there's a big variety of sizes here for fatty acids overall. Okay. The other thing, so we can have uh, what's referred to as um, unsaturated fatty acids. So this, the, the polymate stereo I showed before didn't have any double bonds in the carbons uh, in the hydrophobic, uh, uh, the, the hydrocarbon chain of. Uh, all the carbon acids. Um, and so that's referred to as saturated fatty acids. Saturated meaning it has, it doesn't have any double bonds in it. Um, the unsaturated then, that is where you introduce one or more double bonds somewhere in the hydrocarbon chain. Now when you do this, um, you, you basically have possibilities uh, to the configuration basically how you would do this. There's trans, trans uh, uh, double, double bond to put in here, or a cis double bond. Now, uh, 
uh, basically system vines are the ones that are natural. So basically, that's what we can do. Um, and plants and, and bacteria. Um, uh, trans, uh, transitive bonds are much harder to make, and they're actually, as I'll show in a second, that's actually made usually in an industrial process um, and added back to uh, various foods for basically uh, cost cutting measures for the most part. Um, so, cis double bond is the most common, but both are possible. Um, okay. You'll see too that that changes quite a bit the, the way, like a trans double bond still, it has basically a straight chain here on the uh, carbons, whereas a cis double bond here, that changes the directionality of the fatty acid quite a bit. So that'll be important later when we talk about how these pack together and it'll change their, it'll change their physical properties um, as we'll see in a little bit. Okay, so unsaturated has double bond and saturated doesn't. Now to get into the systematic name, um, this basically we start numbering a fatty acid based off of, this is one with a lot of uh, unsaturated uh, double bonds here. Um, these are uh, these are cis double bonds, just I haven't drawn it where it like kind of keeps it over to the side, but it, this would not be actually flat, it'd be kind of like circling around by itself if you're drawing how it actually is supposed to be. Um, so you start numbering, uh, one way to start numbering here is the number here at the carboxy carbon. So one all the way to the end. Now uh, the, uh, the second carbon here, that's referred to sort of multiple ways to name this here. The alpha carbon is at the second, is the, is the sort of the second actual carbon. Um, uh, and, and then the, the beta at the third position, so there's sort of other ways to, to number this thing. But the way that we sort of will do this most in here is just sort of numbering it with like one to 20, let's say. So just know that you start at the carboxy and number it to the end. Um, and that alpha position is at number two. Uh, so uh, in addition, you will you'll indicate the number of um, sort of double bonds that are present. So this is so if they're present at all. And so here there's five double bonds. So you say 20 uh, colon five. And so that would indicate that this is a C, so, so 20 carbons in the whole fatty acid, and there's five double bonds there. If there was no double bonds, you could just put, basically you wouldn't put anything, you just say C20. Um, then, to indicate the position of the double bonds in the fatty acid, after that first part, you put a delta and a superscript, you indicate the first carbon where the double bond starts. So uh, this, this double bond starts here at five, this is eight, 11, 14, 17. That's what you put up here at the top. So that indicates where the double bond in the fatty acid is present. So you combine all this together, and you would get for this very complicated fatty acid uh, uh, 20 colon 5. And then uh, what I didn't mention here is that for each of these double bonds, you indicate what the configuration is for each of them. And usually they're cis, so this kind of gets kind of silly when you have this many double bonds. Um, but you have cis, 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 cis uh, delta, and then the position of the top. So systematically, this is how I want you to be able to number and name these fatty acids. So you count how many double bonds there are, and then you name where they're going to be at? Correct. <coughs> okay, thanks. That's the number of double bonds. This is the number of total carbons. Okay. And then, yeah, the configuration of the double bonds and where they're at. Correct. Yeah. Is the structure? Yeah. And it, I typically, I mean, I'm, I'm probably not going to ask you to do it with this many double bonds. Like I said, it's just complicated. It's like five alone. Any other questions about this? Okay, so this is the sort of the size of polymer and stereo, because each of these fatty acids all have different actual like company. Don't worry about the company, so the um, But this is sort of the systematic way that they can be able to name these uh, uh, these fatty acids. And then, oh, then, then I will say go in the other direction. If I give you a systematic name, be able to draw that fatty acid. So definitely do that. So go in both directions there. <clears throat> okay. One last thing I have to mention is an alternative numbering system that indicates. Uh, or relates to essential fatty acids. So um, we are numbering from this sort of alpha end where the, the carboxy group is at all the way up to 20. 
Um, there's this omega numbering system here where you number from the opposite end, from the carboxy group, towards the back towards the carboxy group. Now, you do this because in humans, we can't put any unsaturated big we can't put double bonds just anywhere we want in fatty acids. So if we ingest dietary fats, um, or we make them, let's say, so we make our own fatty acids, we can put a couple double bonds in there, but not pass position, uh, basically we can't put it past just uh, the uh, position um, 10. So basically these first ones we can put in, but we can't put in these out here at position 14 or position 17. Um, so what that means, Basically, the ends of these fatty acids, um, we can't put these double bonds in, but we have very important things that are derived from fatty acids that have these sort of uh, extra double bonds put in where we can't put them in. Okay, so what that means is uh, we have this omega numbering system that kind of focuses on this end because this is the end that we're kind of wanting to talk about the double bonds being on. Um, and so we have, uh, uh, so one, two, three, five, six, seven, with the omega here, and omega, and we refer to it as minus, so omega minus three, omega minus six. These are the two different positions that are most important for, um, uh, uh, basically for our essential fatty acids that we need. Um, these, these are uh, essential types of fatty acids. For double bonds that are two or sorry three or six carbons from the end of the fatty acid, we can't put these double bonds in. We don't have the right enzymes to do this. We have to get them from our diet. So if you've ever heard of like um, omega uh, omega oils, like fish oil, salmon oil, this is what it's referring to: omega minus three and omega minus six. These are the fats we're coming from. Um, oh, and then this is uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFA. That abbreviation for that. That's just referring to these these mini fats that have all these double bonds, especially at the omega minus three and omega minus six. So a little bit more about this. So we have these omega, omega fatty acids, um, and we get these from our diet, so basically omega three and omega, omega minus six. Now, um, effectively here, omega minus three is the fish stuff and olive oil, and omega minus six egg, poultry, vegetable oil. Um, and we kind of look at the ratio between these two essential fatty acids, or these two essential fat types of fat. Um, and so our dietitians say that this ratio should be about one. Um, a lot of times, this ratio of, of omega minus six to omega minus three. Um, a lot of times in our sort of common diets that we have now, uh, this ratio is actually way out of whack. So like 30 to one, so like way less fish to olive oil and way more vegetable oil and eggs and poultry. Uh, and so this is the idea that this is sort of correlating with things like uh, cardiovascular uh, issues, heart disease, things like this. And if you have sort of the like Mediterranean diet people talk about, that tries to get this back where you have more of the fish, more of the olive oil, more salmon and stuff like that. Uh, and less of just chicken and vegetable oil and stuff. So this, this is why omega minus three is a specific type of essential oil here that a lot of people say, dietitians say, is a good thing to have. So a little bit of an aside on what dietary stuff. All right. Questions so far? Okay. Okay, so okay. let's relate this stuff back to sort of physical properties. Um, We'll run about back to more connections with food, so we have more uh, relevance. Um, but solubility and melting point. So all this stuff, all these fatty acids are not, they have very low solubility, um, but there's relative differences here. Um, so one thing that affects solubility here is that it's going to decrease as the chain length increases. So as the longer that carbon chain is, the bigger the fatty acid is basically, the less soluble it is more hydrophobic part of it, more insoluble in water. Um, the other thing is melting point. Melting point as, uh, basically as we change, uh, decrease the length of the, uh, decrease the size of that fatty acid, we're going to have a decreased melting point, a lower melting point, so it'll take less heat to melt the, the fat that we're talking about. And as we have number of double bonds here increases, we'll decrease the melting point also. Uh, so, so more double bonds, uh, especially the cis double bonds, the decreasing of the melting point occurs. Okay, so we'll kind of explain this as we go along. 
Okay, so this uh, first talking about getting back to the unsaturated fats and how they affect the melting point. And it really has to do with this sort of extra, so here's a, a very saturated fatty acid here. The chain is very straight. Um, when you have, in the first instance, just one of them, you pack a whole bunch of these next to each other in an oil or fat or something, um, they're going to pack very close together. And so the configuration can be very well organized. If you have a cis configuration um, in the fatty acid here, the unsaturated fatty acids, it creates kind of like a kink here. This extra kink when it's packed next to other ones that are unsaturated is going to make so they don't pack very well close together. And so that physical change here is going to change the melting point of the, uh, of the fat that you're talking about. So showing the packing here, here is a group of saturated fatty acids, the little ball at the top would be that carboxyl, the carboxyl group, that negative charge on the end, and then the hydro, uh, hydrophobic tails here um, at, the, at the bottom. And you see that when you have an unsaturated, a cis unsaturated fatty acid, um, these kind of are sort of all dancing around here, and it doesn't pack very close together. So unsaturated cis fatty acid will have a lower melting point because it's not as organized. It takes less heat to denature that structure that this is forming than this structure. This is much more well organized. It takes more heat uh, uh, to, um, more thermal energy basically, heat, more heat to melt this versus this. Now, uh, we can relate this uh, back directly to like actual practical things. Um, and compare the difference between olive oil, butter, and seed fats. So these things at room temperature act very differently. So olive oil, the liquid, and at room temperature, 25 degrees, um, butter is sort of, I mean, it's a solid, it's not like super hard, but it's definitely not like oil. Seed fat, pretty hard. So this all has to do with the content of the fatty acids that are in there. Olive oil has a lot of unsaturated fatty acids. When you increase the amount of saturated fatty acids, uh, either small and larger ones here, and decrease the amount of unsaturation, we increase the melting point of butter. And so it would take, and so that's why at, room at the same temperature, it will be solid versus the oil that's liquid at room temperature. Because the oil has a lower melting point of the fat uh, compared to the fat that's present in the uh, butter. Taking to the more extreme, <clears throat> we have even more saturated fat in beef, and so that's even harder. So it's kind of more and more saturated, more and more um, uh, sort of higher and higher um, melting point here for this uh, for these fats, for these fatty acids. So um, this is all natural fats at 25 degrees, and sort of shows how we can get different actual physical qualities from the uh, stuff that we eat. Okay. Yeah. Where would coconut oil fall? Is coconut oil kind of like kind of like Frisco sort of? It's or is it more liquidy? Right. It's right. between it's olive oil and butter, I would say. It's considered a saturated fat, but then I've heard that it's a healthy fat. So healthy yeah. saturated fat. I'd say it's probably it's between butter and olive oil. Okay. I haven't used it a lot, so I forget exactly how it but yeah, if it, it's it sort of solid wise, it, it melting point wise, it's probably somewhere in there. Now, uh, yeah, whether or not it's healthy, yeah, I've heard it's also healthier too. Yeah, I've heard that. But um, not actually totally sure why it would be healthier than than like olive oil or other options. There's probably something to it more than I don't know. I don't know a lot about the. I know some nutrition, but I don't know a lot about specific nutrition stuff. Find out, let me know. Okay. More, more comments on this stuff. But I will say one thing here, and that's the trans fatty acids. So I know a little bit about this. Um, so remember the trans fatty acids, those are, uh, those basically, so the, there's still the, the unsaturation that's in there, but they're not going to form those kinks. They're still going to be basically linear fatty acids, even though they have a double bond in there. Um, this is put in basically via a process called partial dehydrogenation. Um, they take a normal uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 sort of a normal unsaturated fatty acid, and they the they, they, the industries that do this um, basically will through an industrial process 
uh, change the unsaturation from cis to trans. And they do this so that the uh, basically the, um, uh, the 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 basically the increase the shelf life of the oil that they're using. Um, usually, deep brine is one of the biggest things, and that basically means that because you basically stabilize this so it packs closer together, it's less of a liquid, so it sort of has a higher melting point, and so it, it it'll work when you heat it up. But when you're just storing it around, it would be sort of more solid. I guess more like this uh, uh, other oil. Um, and, and so from this here, it's going to uh, basically be cheaper because we can store it easier. Now the idea here is that um, uh, with this higher melting point from the cis and all this stuff, um, that's sort of the physical properties of it and why they did it um, in terms of you know, decreased food costs. Uh, but it really has been connected to like, the way we metabolize uh, uh, trans fatty acids. Um, they basically ban now for the most part. The problem is it increases our bad cholesterol, the LDL, um, a lot more than cis fatty acids do, just based on how it's metabolized. Um, so basically it increases your cholesterol level more for an equal amount of consumption of a trans fatty acid than a cis fatty acid. Um, and it reduces your good cholesterol, HDL, so it's a bad thing to really to have it. Uh, so overall it's actually been um, Kind of the things that reason that uh, last I heard this was something that was basically being banned at a uh, national level in the U.S. Um, for a variety of uh, like fast food places and stuff, primarily the ones that use this. Um, so hopefully, get back here they get sort of decreasing our risk here of cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> this is just showing what I mean. And basically, this this would be a normal cis fatty acid here, cis zero ratio down saturation. With the trans, you're gonna have a higher melting point because even though it has that little bond in there still, it's gonna pack very close together compared to how it wasn't packing very well with the six. So that's that's really like physically why why this stuff has a higher melting point and why it's more stable to store trans fatty acids uh, than it is the cis ones. So why they why it's cheaper. Okay. Um, so uh, the Last bit of uh, stuff here. Um, get back and uh, sort of back into uh, uh, sort of other other aspects of fats. Now, triacylglycerol. So this is the storage form that fatty acids get kind of assembled into when they're not being metabolized, basically. So you you ingest fat, it gets broken down into free fatty acids, transported to various uh, places like uh, fat cells or whatever, and kind of store them, and then added together here to form triacylglycerols. Um, there are three separate fatty acids on each for each triacylglycerol, so try three fatty acids on a glycerol backbone. Um, there are still sort of this, this whole trends of packing and physical properties and all this stuff of the individual fatty acids. Um, you can you can have sort of it, you know if you have more uh, all the trends we talked about with the fats and the, the liquids and the oils and fat all that stuff. That applies to the triacylglycerol also. So um, if it has, if the individual combinations of fatty acids on their own have a higher melting point, then the triacylglycerol will also help this one versus another one would have a higher melting point. So those same trends are there. Like I mentioned, this is the primary storage here for fat um, in the body. Here in the triacylglycerol form, there are a, uh, even less, um, these, these molecules are even less uh, uh, polar than the free fatty acid because the carboxyl kind of head group of fatty acid, that's what's linked to the glycerol backbone. So even less um, a free negative charge on that end because it's linked covalently to this glycerol backbone structure. Uh, also, it, it packs really, really well. And so in these uh, fat cells, you basically have these big fat droplets where it's just a whole bunch of triacylglycerols um, and very, very, very little water. Uh, so these big fat blocks, basically, that are in these fat cells are just a whole bunch, for the most part, a whole bunch of these triacylglycerols. Okay, so uh, uh, not very dense here. <clears throat> so this is the structure. Um, this is the glycerol backbone. Three carbon backbone structure. Three hydroxyls on it, on glycerol. Um, each of these will be where a fatty acid is attached. And so when we attach the fatty acid, uh, in each of these positions, carbon one, two, and three, um, the carboxyl group gets attached to this backbone here. Uh, and once again, you don't have the negative charge anymore. So have that, uh, you know, 
a little on oxygen, but not a negative, not a negative charge. Um, and you link your fatty acids on here. Now, the the a lot of times these triacylglycerols don't have the same. So each the, each fatty acid is on a single triacylglycerol is not usually the same fatty acid. Um, usually they're all about 16 to 18 carbons, so that's usually the same. Uh, sometimes one's a little bit like 18 carbons, one might be 16, and another one might have a little bit of uh, unsaturation in it. So usually they're not all exactly the same. Um, sometimes they can be more so. Uh, but I mean, as we're drawn here, they're three different ones. Um, and kind of overall, we kind of see the sort of Another way to look at the structure, it's sort of like this three, uh, three looking like pack looking thing that uh, has uh, uh, the glycerol here at the top and then the three kind of tails of the, of the, the hydrocarbon tails coming off of it. Okay, so this is the main structure here for storing fats in the, in the body. So is it, so when they bond, does it create water in concentration because the way it's removed and then the carb starts to block the food that has the glycerol? Yeah, they would create water to remove it. Yeah, good point. <clears throat> now, this is another one where I want you to be able to draw this structure. Now, I'm going to draw glycerol and be able to draw fatty acids attached to the glycerol backbone. Okay, so, um, so this is fuel storage here. Now, Kind of, we'll get into this more at the end of the semester a little bit, but we have uh, energy sources here, uh, primarily fat, two main sources of weight, fats and uh, carbohydrates, the form of glucose. Um, fats carry a lot more energy than, um, uh, than, than carbohydrates do, but it takes longer to mobilize that energy from fats than it does from glucose. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, really, they're, they're, they're just uh, they're very sort of they're great, or great storage here because there's way less water. So, yeah, water is made when, when they're formed here, but when, when they're actually packed together, they can pack much closer together. These triacylglycerols can pack very close together in these fat clouds without any water. Um, whereas glycogen still has a little bit of polarity associated with it. Um, it's very dense, very, very good structure here. Um, but those glucose that's packed in glycogen here, that's, that has a little bit of water in it. Uh, so think of glucose derived from glycogen as sort of quick delivery energy, whereas these fats stored in triglycerol, that's a little bit more of an involved process to get that whole series of metabolism going. Um, there are, uh, so yeah, so this takes a little bit longer here for these fats to be released. And there's a whole series of hormones that trigger this pathway that we're not going to really get into too much. We mainly focus on uh, glucose and that in these class. Okay, but, there, but the takeaway here is that triacylglycerols are very efficient, efficient storage of protein. And I always end with uh, chronic coins. I almost end with this. This is to show you these are uh, adipose, this is adipose tissue, this is white adipose tissue. These are sort of just two different types of fat cells. These are the ones that are going to primarily store the triacylglycerols. Um, each of these, you know, each of these are individual cells. Uh, basically, the white, that's triacylglycerol fat globules. That's like all of that. And these little, uh, little pink spots, that's the nucleus. So these cells, these are cells that do have a nucleus here, so they can replicate and do all sorts of stuff. Um, just a precise comparison, that pretty much these fat cells are just full of fat. Uh, so this shows how dense these structures are with a lot of triacylglycerol being stored in here. Um, and then that, and then under the right conditions, triacylglycerol would be broken down into free fatty acids, and those free fatty acids would be broken down into energy. That's sort of the overall way how we do that. Okay, so next time we'll get into uh, recontrol of membranes and then the types of foods that are involved with that. Remember, so keep in mind that next Wednesday we have a quiz. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, it, uh, it, it will definitely go with the stuff from today. Um, a, a little bit of Monday, but primarily it's going to be uh, up to today. So keep that in mind. Not Monday, but Wednesday.